On this edition of Vietnam Report, elements of the Army's 9th Infantry Division conduct combat sweep operation in the Mekong Delta's Dinh Thuong Province. Air Force strike aircraft hit enemy targets in North and South Vietnam. 25th Infantry Division unit turns captured rockets back on enemy positions. And the U.S. Navy begins tests of the world's largest hydrofoil, the Plainview. Vietnam Report, a television review of United States participation in the Vietnam War, filmed by combat cameramen on the scene. Now from Washington, here is Alan Smith. According to a report from MACV headquarters in Saigon, the Quezon outpost is being inactivated. The report indicates the step is being taken because of significant changes in the situation near the demilitarized zone. These include an increase in friendly strength, mobility and firepower, and a similar increase in the enemy threat due to a greater flow of replacements and a change in his tactics. Figures cited in the report presently put the enemy's strength in the i corps zone at eight divisions as compared to six in January. Defense Secretary Clark Clifford estimated infiltration from the north during the month of May at 29,000 troops and projected infiltration during June, July, and August at 20,000 per month. Most of this number were replacements rather than new troops. To meet the increased threat, the Military Assistance Command has decided to take maximum advantage of the superior firepower and mobility of forces under its command. The report indicates the mobile posture adopted during Operation Pegasus in April will be continued. Thus, according to MACV, making the maintenance of a base at Quezon unnecessary. The outpost at the western edge of the DMZ was besieged by North Vietnamese forces for 77 days earlier this year. The siege was finally broken by a joint U.S. Arvin ground force on April 7th. At nearby Camp Evans, elements of the Army's 83rd Artillery recently conducted firing missions in support of Operation Jeb Stewart. The combat sweep near the DMZ was designed to counteract the large buildup of enemy forces in that region. Tom DeCastro covers one of those artillery missions by gunners from the 83rd's 1st Battalion. These Army artillerymen attached to the 1st Air Cavalry Division are preparing their big 8-inch howitzers to fire on enemy positions near the DMZ. The support action is part of Operation Jeb Stewart, a combat sweep in the Northern I Corps planned to offset the increasing number of North Vietnamese troops concentrating in that area. The artillery missions will be backing up troops of the 1st Air Cab's 1st Brigade engaged in the ground sweep. From their positions at Camp Evans, the four howitzers can fire their 200-pound projectiles a distance of 10 miles, giving the battery a wide covering capability. Targets are radioed to the gun directors by forward observers acting as spotters. Once they're pinpointed, the big artillery pieces go to work on the enemy positions, bracketing them with a barrage of 8-inch shells. After each firing mission, the field observers make reconnaissance checks of their assigned targets and either report damage or request additional strikes. Because of the continued buildup of enemy forces near the DMZ, artillery units like the 83rd have been working almost around the clock to help neutralize the threat from the north. According to commanders in the field, they have been substantially successful in this effort. This is AFRTS correspondent Tom DeCastro. Later the same day those films were taken, Camp Evans was hit by a fierce enemy rocket and mortar attack. B Battery and other artillery units at the 1st Cavalry Division Headquarters Base returned the barrage and shot flares into the air to spot the communist positions. A short time later, the enemy guns fell silent after having caused only minor damage to the camp. Near the end of May and during the first weeks of June, Air Force strike aircraft conducted numerous missions against enemy positions and facilities in both North and South Vietnam. Aircraft participating in the strike and support operations included F-100 Super Sabres, F-105 Thunder Chiefs, F-4 Phantoms, and prop-driven A-1 Sky Raiders. On May 25th in the Republic, an F-100 bombed an enemy-held area 40 miles southwest of Saigon in support of Operation Jeb Stewart III. Two fires resulting from the low-level strike were photographed by the plane's aft pod camera. The next day, a second Super Sabre dropped a napalm bomb on a Viet Cong bunker complex west of Bien Hoa. The strike mission was flown in support of a South Vietnamese ground operation named Tong Tong. No report of damage was made because of extensive smoke and fire in the target area, but the enemy system was believed to have been almost totally destroyed as a result of the attack. Also in support of an Arvin ground action, a third group of F-100s dropped high drag bombs on VC bunker positions some 30 miles west of Vong Tau in the Mekong Delta. Six bunkers were destroyed and four others damaged during the strike. 
On June 1st, Air Force A-1 Sky Raiders pounded an enemy position southwest of Da Nang with 750-pound bombs. A later report indicated that all hits were directly on target and caused considerable damage. In North Vietnam, an F-4 Phantom fired an air-to-ground missile at a road during a series of strikes on enemy transportation facilities 28 miles south of Dong Hoi. The plane's forward blister camera recorded the flight of the missile and a direct hit on the North Vietnamese highway. Junks on a river were the targets of an Air Force F-105 Thunder Chief just north of Dong Hoi on June 13. Three of the boats were destroyed and six others were damaged. During the extensive search and rescue effort southwest of Khe San, an Air Force A-1 Sky Raider pilot was downed by enemy ground fire while flying flak suppression for the initial SAR mission. The second rescue operation was immediately begun to pick up this bad pilot, Major William Palink of the 602nd Air Commando Squadron. A wide search had previously been launched for a downed U.S. Navy A-7 Corsair pilot, and Major Palink's plane was part of a group of 189 sorties participating in that SAR effort. He was forced to bail out when his aircraft was hit by heavy ground fire. A jolly green chopper from the 40th Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Squadron picked up the airman in hostile territory only eight minutes after his Sky Raider was shot down. While the rescue was in progress, other A-1s flew fire suppression for the hovering jolly green. The Major had been spotted easily in the rugged terrain when his parachute snagged on a treetop. Although considerably shaken by his narrow escape, he was reported to be in good condition and soon after he was returned to his squadron. Major Palink's rescue brought to 1,289 the total number of combat saves made by the Air Force rescue units in Southeast Asia. The object of the initial search effort, Navy Lieutenant Kenneth Fields, was picked up a few hours later by a second Jolly Green Giant helicopter crew. Since their deployment to Vietnam in September 1965, CH-47 Chinook helicopters have recovered more than $1 billion worth of downed aircraft. About 75% of that total number of planes were returned to service within three or four days, representing a savings of nearly $300 million a year in replacement costs. The value of recovered aircraft is nearly twice the government's initial investment for the total Chinook fleet. Operating with the Army, the choppers are averaging $1 million worth of helicopters and fixed-wing recoveries a day. The 4,000 planes salvaged thus far range from nine-passenger Iroquois assault helos to other 44-passenger Chinooks. Because of a joint U.S.-South Vietnamese operation, the large number of refugees created by the enemy's continuing attacks on the city of Saigon are receiving help in rebuilding their homes or relocating their families. Dubbed Operation Dong Tom, meaning hearts together, the project is concentrating on the two hardest-hit areas of the capital, Districts 6 and 8. Hoyt Wirtz has the details of this joint civic action effort. These scenes of ruin and destruction are the result of a continuing series of Viet Cong assaults on the South Vietnamese capital. Even the limited success achieved by the enemy's rockets and mortar attacks has added to the already large number of refugees in the Saigon area. But a joint U.S.-South Vietnamese force is presently helping to ease the overwhelming problem by clearing debris and initiating an extensive construction program for the homeless. Titled Hearts Together, the high-priority operation was begun on May 13th in the capital area and neighboring Jardin province. Units involved are the U.S. Army's 46th Engineer Battalion, various Arvin groups, and a large Vietnamese civilian force. The U.S. Air Force has made available a sizable amount of construction equipment. The men are concentrating their efforts in Saigon's districts 6 and 8, which have suffered the most from the Viet Cong shellings. Much of the housing material is prefabricated at this racetrack on the outskirts of the city. Costs of the project are being borne jointly by the U.S. Agency for International Development and the government of South Vietnam. When the clearing and rebuilding are completed, it will represent not just a return to the status quo, but a considerable improvement of living conditions in the Saigon area and a brighter future for these refugees. This is White Wirtz reporting. As the result of a recent sweep mission near Ku Chi, 25th Infantry Division soldiers were able to use some captured enemy weapons against their original owners. Several communist rocket rounds and a launcher were confiscated during the operation northwest of Saigon and later handed over to division artillery for disposal. 
With a report on this unique turnabout by the Tropic Lightning Troops, here's Greg Hoadley. This is an enemy 122 millimeter rocket round. It's identical to ones used by the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese in their recent bombardment of the city of Saigon. The rockets and this launcher were captured by 25th Infantry Division soldiers during a recent combat sweep just northwest of the South Vietnamese capital. The munitions were then taken to division headquarters at Kuchi for examination and intelligence analysis. Later, they were turned over to these Tropic Lightning artillerymen for disposition. Rather than destroy the enemy weapon and ammunition, the soldiers elected to get some worthwhile use from the large rockets. Just outside the Kuchi perimeter, the men set off the launcher and prepared to fire against enemy positions in the vicinity of the 25th Infantry Division base camp. A short time later, several rounds were launched at the same emplacements that had fired on the Americans only a few days before, giving the enemy a taste of its own medicine. This is AFRTS correspondent Greg Holman. Just recently, elements of the 25th Infantry Division captured a large enemy arsenal containing, among other ordnance, 76 of the 122mm rockets. The find was made 10 miles northwest of Saigon in an area known to have been used by the Viet Cong to launch attacks on the capital. After inspection at division headquarters, the rocket rounds were fired by an Arvin artillery unit with the 25th Infantry Division soldiers acting as advisors. The rockets were part of one of the largest enemy weapons caches found in the Saigon area to date. Other ordnance confiscated included mortar rounds, grenades, and small arms ammunition. Elements of the 9th Infantry Division recently participated in Operation Trung Kong Din, a Delta reconnaissance mission in Twin Thuong Province. Working with a unit of the South Vietnamese Rangers, the U.S. Army troops patrolled through jungle, plantations, and small hamlets, searching for signs of the Viet Cong. Special sweeps were conducted in the province's Cam San area near the Rock Barai River, a tributary of the strategic Mito waterway. Fred Thompson reports on that recent action in the Mekong Delta. Transported by boats of the Delta Riverine Force, these troops of the Army's 9th Infantry Division are launching an intensive combat sweep and reconnaissance mission in Ding Trong Province, southwest of Saigon. This action is part of a larger sweep operation named Trong Kong Ding, after a Vietnamese hero executed by the French. Goals of the mission are to pinpoint and then destroy Viet Cong positions, supply caches, and infiltration systems in this part of the Delta. Two areas, one in the Cam San section of the province and the other near a bend in the Rock Barai River, are special objectives of the patrol. Only a short distance from the river, the soldiers come under heavy enemy fire and immediately set up defensive positions and gun emplacements. Aided by mortar and machine gun fire from the Riverine Force's monitor gunboats, the 9th Division troops advance on the VC bunkers, laying down a heavy barrage of their own. The fierce firefight continues for about an hour when the Viet Cong forces suddenly break contact. After lobbing a few grenades ahead of them, the men move up to secure the former enemy stronghold. Not far from the battle scene is a small village, which the men enter in search for signs of the fleeing Viet Cong. Several enemy snipers pepper the searching soldiers and are quickly taken care of by perimeter guards. Later, after checking ID cards of the residents and looking for enemy supply caches, the patrol leader reports to headquarters and the men move out to hunt the retreating VC unit. No further contact with the enemy was made on this sweep and the next day the troops were picked up by Riverine Force boats for return to base. The two-day mission had blocked the Viet Cong's attempt to build a large fighting force in this area of the Delta. This is AFRTS correspondent Fred Thompson. Much of the action in that report was photographed by Army PFC W.L. Beck, a combat cameraman with the 9th Infantry Division's 9th Signal Battalion. Even during close fighting, Beck continued his photographic coverage. A Montagnard training center located in the Central Highlands near Pleiku has been actively involved in the military education of the mountain tribesmen for more than three years now. Similar to a basic training facility, the school's objectives are to help the Montagnards guarantee the security of their villages and hamlets, while at the same time teaching them to build a better life for themselves. With the story of this unique training complex and some of its effects on communities in the Central Highlands, here's Tom Hayden. A call to the colors begins each day at this training center in the Central Highlands. The students here are Montagnard tribesmen, both men and women. 
who will eventually be formed into revolutionary development teams in their home provinces. During their 12-week stay at the school, the trainees learn Hamlet defense and security procedures, as well as other basic military skills. These include the proper handling and use of small arms, machine guns and grenades, and the principles of ambush and patrol operations. Close order drill and physical conditioning are also part of the curriculum. In addition to these military objectives, the school also places a great deal of emphasis on civil affairs programs. And although the students follow a regular military schedule in the morning, portions of the afternoon are devoted to vocational and educational training. The men learn such trades as carpentry, blacksmithing, barbering, animal husbandry, and agriculture. The women are taught home economics, sewing, knitting, and other domestic skills. All of these training courses will help raise village living standards, and they promise a better life for individual families. Upon completion of their course of instruction at the Play Crew Center, these students will return to their villages better able to cope with the specific needs of their Montagnard brothers. This is AFRTS correspondent Tom Hayden. Unlike most armed conflicts in the world's history, South Vietnamese women and children are allowed in many cases to live with their soldier husbands and fathers. In rural areas of the Republic, where Vietnamese regional forces guard villages and hamlets against the Viet Cong, wives and families live and work beside their men. Their homes are reinforced defensive bunkers, and their lives are considerably influenced by military procedures. This is one of many such fortified camps dotting the South Vietnamese countryside. It's manned and defended by a group of regional forces especially schooled in rural hamlet protection. The men have attended one of several cadre training courses in the Republic to learn construction techniques, use of small arms, military tactics, and village perimeter defense procedures. All through the various phases of instruction and after they are reassigned to one of these forts, the regional force soldiers are allowed to live with their wives and families. Although quarters are provided at the school, once they report to their village duty station, they must build and maintain their own accommodations. Housing is designed for protection against mortar and artillery attack, as well as being functional. Women and children work right beside the head of the family, combining domestic chores with those of a normal military routine. In addition to the wifely duties of cooking, dishwashing, and cleaning, the South Vietnamese women participate in defense drills and are even trained to bear arms in case of an enemy attack. Their lives in these small triangular forts are often likened to those of American frontier women. Although regional force troops and their families live under constant danger from marauding bands of the Viet Cong, because of good training and extensive defenses, they're prepared to meet this peril. Just over a month ago, a new deep water port was opened at Asadaheep on the southeastern coast of Thailand, 135 miles south of Bangkok. The new facility is now handling 98% of all goods earmarked for the 47,000 U.S. servicemen based in that country, plus most of the Air Force munitions slated for targets in North Vietnam. Andrew Kremitis has a report on the port construction project and its present and future capabilities. This is the newly opened port and harbor of Salaheep, a major logistics center for U.S. forces based in Thailand. It's only the second seaport in the country, the other being the city of Bangkok to the north. Construction of this deep water facility was begun some two years ago to allow cheaper logistics support to units headquartered at the six air bases and seven army installations in Thailand. Previously, all U.S. cargo was offloaded in Bangkok and transported overland to the military commands. The utilization of the new port at Sarahip has shaved storage and distribution costs by almost 90%. Built under U.S. Navy supervision with Thai construction support, the harbor and port facilities are now under the control of the U.S. Army's 499th Transportation Battalion. At present, the port has a million new square feet of pier space and a cargo handling capacity of 120,000 tons a month. The storage area includes a large number of sheds and a giant refrigerated warehouse. Three companies of the 499th work round-the-clock shifts to minimize import time for transport vessels. Within the next few months, the Sarahip port facility will become the major supply base for all of Thailand. At present, only military cargo is handled there, but both the United States and Thai officials are planning for the day when commercial shipping will be processed as well. This is AFRTS correspondent Andrew Kremitis. The port of Sarahip has a long history as a naval facility serving many countries. It was designated as a naval port in the early 1920s and served as a Japanese base during the Second World War. It has since been used by the Thai Navy as a secondary harbor. 
Formal ceremonies celebrating the opening of the new logistics center were held May 30th at the Deepwater Complex. Both American Ambassador Leonard Unger and Thailand's Prime Minister Tanan Kittikachorn made dedication speeches. Before the project is completed, Army engineers will build additional large capacity piers and a road system linking Sarayip with other major military centers in Thailand, including Bangkok and Karat. The world's largest hydrofoil, the Plainview, made its first full-scale test runs on the waters of Puget Sound June 20th. An experimental vessel, the speedy 220-foot craft, is a major item in the Navy's overall investigation of hydrofoil boats for possible military use. With the details of the Plainview's design and construction features, here's Jack Powers. The largest hydrofoil vessel ever built by man is currently undergoing its first series of tests in Seattle, Washington's Puget Sound. The giant craft will soon join an extensive Navy program to test the feasibility of using hydrofoil vessels to perform in a variety of military roles and missions. Named the Plain View, the boat incorporates a number of design and construction innovations. Because of the weight problem involved, its hull is built of aluminum, a metal all but ignored in the marine field since the turn of the century. Power is provided by two specially modified jet engines, the same ones used in the Air Force's F-104 Starfighter. The Plainview's wing-like foils each have a span of 13 and a half feet and are constructed of special high-strength steel. Propulsion is provided by two titanium propellers, the largest of their type in the world, which are positioned on the two forward struts. A foil at the stern serves as rudder and stabilizer. Speeds in excess of 40 knots have been achieved by the craft during these initial runs. When underway in a foil-borne position, sensors at the bow and stern determine the height of the vessel above the surface and feed this information to the display and automatic pilot on the bridge. During further tests and when fully operational, the plane view will be manned by a crew of 20 officers and men. Jack Powers reporting. Although not a hydrofoil, one kind of jet-powered boat is already in operation in South Vietnam. The USS Gallup, a specially designed Navy patrol boat, is presently cruising the coast of the Republic as part of Operation Market Time. Based at Nha Trang, the boat's primary mission is the blocking of enemy infiltration attempts into the south, but it can also be called into action against shore targets. Like the Plainview, the Gallup is built on an aluminum hull, and with her jet engine is capable of speeds of more than 40 knots. When the call comes for action, the boat is able to reach top speed from a standstill within 60 seconds. Gallup's firepower includes six guns, headed by a 3-inch, a 40-millimeter, and two twin-mount 50-caliber machine guns. Much of the boat's activity calls for the quick closing on and search of enemy junks. Thus far, because of its speed, maneuverability, and armament, the jet craft has had little trouble countering North Vietnamese or VC infiltration attempts. C-7A Caribous of the 483rd Tactical Airlift Wing have taken on an increasingly larger role in Air Force logistics support operations in South Vietnam. Since its transfer from the Army early in 1967, the aircraft has been a prime carrier of troops and supplies to bases throughout the Republic, and especially remote Special Forces outposts. The twin-engine Caribou is ideal for these missions, able to land on the short, unimproved airstrips of areas like the DMZ in the Central Highlands. Al LePage has the story of C-7A operations in South Vietnam and a rundown on the capabilities that make the aircraft so well-suited for its important job. This is the C-7A Caribou, transferred from the Army to the Air Force more than 18 months ago. It has compiled an enviable record in Vietnam while attached to the 483rd Tactical Airlift Wing. With headquarters at the Coastal Air Complex at Camran Bay, the wing is composed of six squadrons located at airfields throughout the Republic. Their primary mission is the logistic support of bases and special forces camps located in remote or hard-to-reach areas. Often the caribous are the only means of resupply for these outposts. 
The aircraft deliver troops, equipment, ammunition, and mail from sunrise to sunset every day. When they can't land because of rugged terrain or the shortness of the airfield, the cargo is airdropped to the waiting units. Paradrops are necessary, however, in only 3% of all support missions. Because of the caribou's high climb and drop rates, it can land on almost any type and length of runway and has been known to touch down on strips as short as 700 feet. In addition to flying several sorties a day, the aircraft may make a number of stops on each trip, often compiling as many as 40 landings and takeoffs for that day's operations. The C-7A can carry 32 fully equipped combat troops or 6,000 pounds of cargo while maintaining a cruising speed of 130 knots. Because of excellent maintenance procedures and equipment, mission launch reliability has remained at over 99% since the initiation of caribou operations. The plane carries a crew of three, aircraft commander, pilot, and engineer, who also doubles as loadmaster. Some of the units these crews support include the 5th Special Forces Group, the 1st Cavalry Division, and the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force. This is AFRTS correspondent Al LePage. In a letter to Air Force Chief of Staff General J.P. McConnell, 7th Air Force Commander General William Momeyer gave high praise to the caribou operations. He said overall comments from both users and operators were highly favorable, and that a degree of cooperation exists which denotes a milestone in inter-service relationships. The largest airplane in the world, the Air Force's C-5 Galaxy, made its initial test flight on June 30th. The giant transport flown by civilian test pilot Leo Sullivan took off from Dobbins Air Force Base, Georgia, and remained airborne for one hour and 34 minutes. Air Force and civilian officials regarded the first flight as a complete success. After takeoff, the pilot radioed that the huge plane handled beautifully and that it controlled even better than the mock-up simulator. Following a very smooth landing, the five-man test crew, which included Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Joe Sheely, briefed the assembled newsmen that the flight couldn't have been smoother. When the giant C-5 joins the Military Airlift Command uh, fleet next year, it will begin a new era in air transportation. The basic mission for the Galaxy will be to airlift 100,000 pounds of cargo, 5,500 miles of speeds up to 525 miles per hour. The C-5, with the smaller C-141 Starlifter, will be able to airlift entire Army units and their equipment to forward areas anywhere in the world. This includes tanks, mobile bridge launchers, and helicopters. 58 galaxies will be built for the Air Force, eventually boosting the United States airlift capability to 10 times what it was in 1961. On June 5th, General Creighton Abrams, then deputy commander in Vietnam, presented the U.S. Army's second highest decoration for heroism to a chaplain attached to the 199th Light Infantry Brigade. Captain Angelo Latecki who was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross during a ceremony at a temporary fire support base just west of Saigon. Captain Latecki received the medal for valorous actions during a reconnaissance mission in Dien Hoa province last December. While moving through the jungle, the unit of the 199th Light Infantry Brigade he was accompanying was attacked by a well-entrenched battalion of enemy forces. Disregarding his own safety, the chaplain encouraged his troops, aided the wounded, and gave last rites to the dying during the encounter. It was determined the next day that he had personally extracted 20 men from the battlefield while subject to incredibly intense hostile fire. The Distinguished Service Cross awarded to Captain Latecki is the highest decoration ever presented to a chaplain by the Army. Four chaplains, however, have received posthumous congressional medals for heroism approved by a special act in 1960. The awards were given to the next of kin of the four who gave up their life jackets during the Second World War when the SS Dorchester was torpedoed by a German submarine. And that's it for this edition of Vietnam Report. This is Alan Smith. This has been Vietnam Report, a television review of United States participation in the Vietnam War, a presentation of the Armed Forces Information Service.